Good afternoon and welcome to Everything Communicates, creating a culture of hospitality for an improved resident experience. My name is Christy Tronas and alongside with me I have Lisa Welshans and we are with Merit Senior Living and we appreciate your attendance today. As the message indicates in the chat box, please if you have a question throughout, feel free to ask that and we will get to that at the end of the presentation. Today we have three main objectives that we want to cover. Um, we want to understand how everything communicates through place, process, and people. Understand the difference between what we call a transaction versus an interaction. And apply how everything communicates throughout the cycle of service. As consumers, we often look for clues to indicate how we're going to experience a particular service. And oftentimes our residents, our potential residents, vendors, employees, um, look to uh, these nonverbal and verbal cues to dictate how they're going to um, experience the service. And things that we communicate, and maybe we're aware that we communicate, but we're not necessarily sure the message that we're communicating and whether or not that's positive or negative are simple things, nonverbals, like your approach of the exterior of the building. Um, do you have a neon sign outside your place and is a, a light bulb burnt out? Or did the grass just get mowed and you have grass shavings um, throughout the sidewalk that leads to your door? The interior of, the, of your building, paint chippings, are pictures on the wall crooked? And then again, um, your staff, telephone conversations, written conversations, kind of those more verbal interactions that we have. What messages are we um, conveying through those types of communications? Your website. Um, oftentimes I know when I'm looking especially to stay at a hotel, let's say, I go directly to the website because um, there I'm going to be able to look at things like the ratings. What comments are, do people have? What are people saying about that particular hotel? What are people saying about your uh, community? Photos, again, we'll talk about throughout the presentation, but photos can tell, uh, tell a story and uh, make sure that your photos are in line with the actual experience or what they're going to experience when they get to your place of, um, of business. Certainly the types of services that you provide. Um, are they accurate? Are they up to date? Um, do they, again, dictate the correct message to those potential residents? So everything your customer, your resident, those family members, vendors, experiences, um, ex uh, relates some sort of message. The place is the environment within which the service takes place, as you know, and um, depending on how we communicate some of those nonverbals and verbals that we talked about previously can really deploy or derail or improve the perception of the quality of the service or experience that they're going to have. So again, what are outside of our business can already paint a picture, already tell a story even before you've stepped foot, even before you maybe experience in so any sort of customer service once you're inside of the community or once you're inside of a business. Well, potential residents and vendors and potential family members are thinking about these same types of messages when they're visiting your community. Because the fact is, is how we experience life is really through our emotions. We're emotional beings. We want to feel it. Yes, there's some logic to certain things because we have to do things and, you know, things are um, intellectual. But really we're going through, we're experiencing life using our five senses. Five senses of sight, sound, touch, smell, and taste. And we'll talk about how you're engaging your residents' five senses when you're delivering service. Again, typically our first sense that we use is our sight. Our eyes are powerful and the sense of sight is the thing that people focus on the first. And unfortunately, a lot of assumptions can be made about our sight. Again, um, what kind of messages we're communicating through the sight of our community? Um, broken lights, 
broken signs, um, dirty sidewalks. Assumptions can be made just on that one sense. Think about why you take photos. Oftentimes, people take photos of events, of special occasions that they want to remember, a wedding, a first day of a child's school. Um, we take photos so we can pull them out and remember how that made us feel just by viewing, just by seeing those pictures. Well, your residents are um, creating a memory when they are um, seeking service, when they are seeing the types of service um, that they're getting at your community. So it's creating a memory, it's stimulating our mind using one of our senses. How many of you have maybe experienced a sign or maybe been guilty of using a sign such as this? And what message is this picture saying? Is this door blocking off an exit? Is it blocking off maybe the staircase in case of an emergency? Is it blocking off a resident's room? Again, what message are we saying and maybe what we feel, a simplistic, um, non-threatening sign, um, which typically um, we may not even make much thought of, but making sure that we're communicating the right message. Another example, sorry, no reentry through this door. Residents must use the trash room. Um, so again, to enter, trash, what are we saying about our residents when we're um, saying that they need to use the trash room to enter the elevator to go to where they're going. So again, sight, um, powerful. The messages that we're sending through sight are even more powerful. Another sense, sound. What are our residents hearing? Um, is there a lot of background noise when they're trying to have dinner? Are our employees on the phone? Are um, other people um, interrupting maybe conversations or, um, you know, lots of phone lines ringing, uh, lots of background noise? Again, what kind of sounds are um, being heard? Maybe it's um, a positive sound and we have background noise. And if that's the case, and um, maybe we're playing something in the background during dinner, dinner, just making sure that the volume is appropriate, that we're not um, out over-focusing um, so much on the, no on the music that the conversations that the residents are trying to have are, are being overplayed. Touch. How do they feel when they're at that dinner table? How are those linens feeling? Are they rough to their touch or are they soft? Um, if, they, if you provide linens such as towels or bed sheets to maybe the guests of the residents, what kind of quality of linens are you providing to them? Um, typically, if they may be perceived as less than, then that influences the perception of the value and the value that um, you may have in your service and the service that you provide to the residents. Oh, we don't care. We'll use these because they're less expensive. Again, thinking about how um, that's being perceived as the guests of the residents and to the residents. A couple weeks ago, I gave this presentation to another community, and they used an example of touch as far as um, touching between employee and resident and whether or not it's a good touch or a bad touch. And again, what's the perception of the touch? And is it, if it, is it wanted or unwanted? Sometimes that's how we build connection is through touch. And so making sure that the touch is gentle, whether it's a pat on the back or um, a touch of the hand or um, arm around the shoulder. Again, making sure that it's a wanted touch and, and making sure that the, the feel is, is a positive feel. Smell. Smell is a funny one, but it plays such a significant role in your service and in your experience. For most cases, and for most of you in your community, I'm sure that you probably provide at least one meal a day to the residents where they can come and maybe even invite guests to join them. And what's that smell? Uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever um, been guilty of entering a restaurant or a cafeteria and saying, oh my goodness, what does that smell? So this can either be a good thing or a bad um, one. And even though we don't think of our sense of smell as something that we may use a lot, it certainly, especially in the type of industries where, where food is being provided, provided plays a significant role in how um, we think about a particular service situation. 
our office um, is set up in the way that our lunchroom, our break room, happens to be right in the center of all of our um, offices. And so we have to be pay attention to what kind of smells are ruminating throughout our building, especially if we have guests and our front conference rooms to make sure that we're not delivering a negative message when it comes to smell. And finally, again, unless you're in maybe the type of business industry that you are, more hospitality, taste you may not um, use as much, but certainly, again, if we're providing some sort of meal, wanting to make sure that the flavor, the temperature, consistency, and texture is meeting the standards and expectations of our residents and guests. Typically, if you um, have your favorite restaurant, it's because they have served you your favorite meal, and it has um, been you've experienced a positive um, experience based on all those four things there, flavor, temperature, consistency, met your expectations. Therefore, you want to go back and experience that same meal. We want our residents and our guests and our potential residents to come back to experience our food as well. So getting in tune and engaging our residents through the five senses, because again, 80% of how they experience service is through their emotion. We talked about the first place and experiencing the place, again, through your five senses. And now um, we'll talk about process. And when we talk about process, we are talking about how a resident experiences service. And we've all kind of experienced or maybe been guilty of process problems, like people waiting in line or people filling out forms in, tri in triplicate or duplicate and associates frustrated by the process that maybe eliminates their ability to do the job. They have to go step one, step two, step three in order to complete their task. And um, think about a typical resident and what they experience and how they experience our service. And if we consider what they experience during any given interaction with us, a resident typically experiences the service as events. And we all know that when an employee starts, usually they're given some sort of job description, listing out duties, tasks that they must complete within this job description, whether they're a housekeeper. We know that, yes, we must vacuum their room twice a day, or we must do their laundry, we must dust their floors. And those things um, are all givens, if you will, but they're more logical, right? Talked about 20% of how we experience service, and it's the logical things. It's the things, the tasks that we're assigned to do to get the job done. What we're talking here when we talk about the cycle of service and touch points and how they experience that service, we're engaging those five senses we talked about. So for an example, a housekeeper who one of their tasks, one of their logical tasks may be to vacuum the resident's floor. Well, the service really starts at that initial knock at the door. And again, in, in being in tune with one of those five senses, how does that knock sound? Is it forceful? Is it too gentle that the resident can't even hear him so you're sitting at the door knocking for a minute? So once you've knocked on the door and welcomed yourself in, how, um, how is your appearance? What do you, how are you appearing to that resident? Are you well-groomed? Is there a smile on your face? Is your name tag crooked? Your shirt untucked? Next, how um, you may smell. You know, certainly um, some people are more sensitive to smells than others, and we may experience this more um, working with residents. But um, did you douse yourself in perfume that day, or um, maybe, you have an order about you that um, the resident just has uh, troubles with. So what, what is your smell? And again, how again are you completing that service? Um, through um, your face expressions, through how you're treating their valuables. Because remember, this is their home and they, they're expected to be treated as if, as if it is their home. So cycle of service and each touch point that we're doing to complete that mundane task, maybe, of vacuuming the floor. Challenge your employees to think about engaging the resident's five senses in completing that task. People. 
as we all know, we can't get the job done without people. So people is our last P, but the most important, because people make the difference. And one of the reasons, the main reasons why we do this training a lot for our communities and especially for the employees is because they do make the difference. And they can either make or break the experience for our resident. It's getting in tune with that cycle of service and giving those extra touches. Again, not just going into the room and saying, oh, you're my last room I have to do today, and otherwise I'm out the door. You're the only thing that stopped me from getting off the clock. You know, again, making sure that each one of those tasks um, that we're providing um, service that's reaching those five senses. While every moment is important when serving our resident, we talked about in that circle of service, there are really two times we find to be particularly important, and that's what we call our first impressions and our last impressions. And why are first impressions so important? Well, as you've heard and probably said, um, you never get a second chance to make a good per first impression, right? And as we know, that first impression really sets the tone for how the rest of the interaction with the resident is going to go. Remember we talked about the first impression of maybe your website or what your building looks like. Again, you've never, you haven't even, your resident hasn't stepped foot in the place of business yet, but already they're making, um, you're making first impressions. First impressions can be your facial expressions. Again, we talked about um, the going into the resident's room. What is your face expression? Am I hiding my emotion for, for the day? Have I had a bad day and I, am I communicating that to the resident? My posture. My grooming, again, am I well-groomed? Do I have armpit stains on my shirt that automatically may presume or give the assumption to the resident that I did not bathe or I, I smell? Um, my overall attitude. How can we enhance that first impression? Again, simple things such as making eye contact, a genuine smile. Are we alert and ready to help? My work environment, is that clean? Um, as you know, and you've probably been guilty of making assumptions when we see um, messy work environments that, where there may be papers all over the place that may um, give the message that they're not organized or that they don't have time to focus on you, the resident, or the staff member because they have too much going on. Um, so making sure your, your work environment is neat. And make sure that you approach the resident instead of waiting for them to approach us. Expecting um, their next um, need, if you will. And then last impressions. Last impressions, why are they so important? Last impressions really seal the deal. Um, they, again, sometimes it doesn't matter what those interactions go on throughout the day. It's more of those lasting impress impressions that um, leave um, an impression to either come back or not to come back to the, to the place of business. And um, my colleague and I often have to travel a lot. And we're often in um, hotels, the hospitality business, where a first and, and a lasting impression make a big difference, especially like in the, your industry. Um, we've been both in situations where at the, when you're ending the service or when you're ending the stay, are they thanking your name? Thank you so much, Ms. Tronis, for um, staying with us, and we anticipate your, your next arrival. Um, are they giving that with a positive attitude? Again, are they welcoming back or author, offering further assistance? I recently had to um, stay at a, a hotel, and I just got done working out, and for some reason I really needed something sugary. And, was dying for a Diet Coke. And if you've experienced hotels like I have, um, most places are doing away with vending machines and going to some sort of pantry where you can buy things to eat, things to drink, or other um, toiletries that you may need. And so I went up to where the concierge desk and was looking around, and the concierge was kind of noticing, um, expecting um, what, what I needed and asked if there was anything that I could, she could help me with. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm looking to see if I can uh, buy a drink, a, a soda. And she said, oh, you know, we have vending machines on our second floor. I said, oh, I appreciate that, but unfortunately I only carry debit card. I don't have any cash on me. She said, oh, no problem. You sit here. I'll be right back. 
she went up to the second floor and got me a Diet Coke, took time out of her day to do that, which um, most definitely um, left a lasting impression. She offered further assistance. She didn't have to go um, beyond the service of um, not only asking if I needed help, but making sure that my needs was met, my needs were met. First and last impressions. What's your staff? What you're doing to making sure that we're making positive first impressions and lasting last impressions. Next, we're going to talk about transactions versus interactions. In transactions, most often um, think about a transaction. Most times I think about transactions that I maybe make at a, a bank. And oftentimes we go to a bank and often um, we're so fast-paced that normally we go to the drive through at the bank, right? And I don't usually have to see, talk to anybody. I'm just slipping my deposit slip in. I'm making that transaction. They're doing exactly what I want. They're depositing in my account. They give me some sort of receipt, and I'm on my way. And again, I can choose to eliminate or um, not even um, or reduce the amount of communication, interaction that I have with whoever is helping me on the other side. So these are transactions. These are basic inter interactions. They're more mechanical. Um, again, they're not feeling based. They're not building relationships. Whereas with an interaction, um, they're more service driven. Um, they they're give the opportunity to have more um, eye contact, more of those first impressions. They're more engaging. Again, they're building relationship relationships. Remember, we're emotional beings. 80% of how we experience life is how you make um, me feel, how that place makes me feel, how that task that you completed made me feel. Are you getting in tune with my five senses? Um, are we providing a sense of, of belonging and it, am I investing my time and energy with um, completing that task and am I building those interactions? So each interaction is in, really is in your staff hands, it's in your hands, and sometimes we all know that we get into the rut of things and um, providing transactions may be simpler, may be quicker, um, but we each have the opportunity to create interactions and um, with, each interac with each resident interaction that we have. In doing this presentation for most of our communities, we have found that um, Really, when people get in tune with more of the emotional side um, with the resident, with the staff, that overall satisfaction, where we've seen satisfaction through the resident surveys or employee satisfaction, has definitely increased. And um, so Lisa Welshon is going to talk about the payoff and the payoff and um, making what you communicate to the residents and to your staff a positive experience. Good afternoon. Um, as Christy uh, alluded to, I'm going to talk <coughs> specifically about how, um, what the return on investment is for implementing these strategies in your community and creating more of a hospitality environment versus a clinical environment. This is a, an actual case study from a CCRC, a continuing care retirement community based in the Midwest. In 2011, they did their resident surveys and their annual resident survey and saw a significant increase over previous years. They scored 93% or above on all of these areas, resident overall satisfaction, staff friendliness, appearance of the grounds, cleanliness of the common areas, and then 87% of their res residents said they would refer the community. The significant thing to remember about this case study is 34 out of 55 factors measured significantly improved over 2010 results. So this was a community that in 2010 was struggling a little bit with resident satisfaction. And after implementing more of a hospitality culture focusing on the everything communicates philosophy, they saw significant improvements. So what does all that lead to? Well, from a financial standpoint and overall sales occupancy, um, they saw tremendous results. Their resident referrals, new leads, subsequent appointments and sales and move-ins all significantly increased. Referrals were up 29%, new leads up 28%, appointments were up 91%, their sales increased by 44% and move-ins by 29%. So obviously a very large payback.
In addition, their resident referrals increased by 25% and today account for 45% of all their um, referrals. The community has a 95% occupancy rate in their independent living and consistently has maintained that. And since the fiscal year ending June 2012, their net operating margin improved 65% over 2011, with a 12% improvement in operating revenues and only a 3% increase in operating expenses. So if you get any resistance um, from your management team on the cost of implementing some of these changes, this is a great example to share with them. So in conclusion, Christy discussed how everything communicates. These are questions I would suggest you ask yourself along with the remainder of your management team. How does your community, your community communicate to the resident via place, process, and people? How do you train and reinforce this with your employees? And do you have a checklist and do a regular walkthrough to hold people accountable? We are now going to open it up to our question portion of the webinar. We've had a couple questions submitted throughout. If anyone else has any, please go ahead and type those in now and we'll um, answer as many as possible and we can always do follow-up as well if you didn't get your question submitted today. The first question um, that was submitted earlier and probably before I did those last few slides, we have an older community with a limited budget. Any ideas for creating a five-star experience under these circumstances? That's a great question, um, one that we get a lot and certainly not a unique situation. Again, I would refer back to that case study and show a cost analysis of the cost of implementing some of these changes and some of the potential return. There's going to be an upfront cost to doing more training, for giving your community a facelift. And even all that being said, you're pro you may not be able to um, add a beautiful fountain to, to your entrance, and, and that's okay. You need to focus on what you can control. Do you have touch-up painting that needs to be done, taped-up signs, um, and then really focus on your people, how they answer the phone, how they're greeting residents, how they're dressed. Those are all very simple solutions that don't cost a lot of money. Um, uh, another question, what are your thoughts on when you introduce this concept to an employee? Um, absolutely would suggest that this is introduced in the job interview, so before they're an employee. You should have um, specific behavioral-based interview questions that you ask all candidates for any position. Uh, three to five questions that will help you determine what their level of customer service and hospitality will be, and if they don't meet, um, the expectations for the position, then regardless if they have all the skills and technical abilities to, um, to meet the job expectation, you probably want to reconsider whether or not they would be a good fit for your community. And then letting them know in the job interview what the culture's like and what the expectations are so that it's you know, really addressed right up front. Um, and then when you do new hire orientation, so much of us um, focus our new hire orientations on all the requirements. Um, especially in our business because there's so many things we have to comply with, with OSHA and bloodborne pathogens and things like that. But um, first and foremost, the new hire orientation should be kicked off with what your uh, resident service expectations are and spend a lot of time on it. Don't spend you know, 10 minutes on that and the rest of the day on what to do if you have a work comp injury or, or sexual harassment. You need to put just as much and show just as much of a focus um, and effort on your service. And then one more just came in. What are the five, or excuse me, what recommendations would you have for a checklist for our community? And um, absolutely start with those five senses that Christy, Christy talked about. Um, and put together a checklist and assign it to um, different ma managers of your different members of your management team that are required to walk your community um, periodically at whatever time you determine probably weekly would be a good frequency and then report back on what they find um, and you know certainly um, thinking about what you can 
um, check off to make sure your, your five senses are all in order. Any other questions? Okay, then we're going to go ahead and conclude. If you do have any questions that were not answered today, please feel free to submit them via email, and we will respond uh, by the end, the end of the day today or the end of the day on whichever day you submit the question. Thank you for your time today. Thank you.